Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Good to see you all. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, Prabhakar, can you please lead us in prayer? Uh, sure, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, exalt your holy name. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity, Father. Thank you for this morning of joy, Father. Thank you for giving us another day. Uh, Father, uh, we submit each and every one unto your throne of praise at this moment, Father. Please lead us into this class, Father, in the marketplace ministry. Uh, bless Pastor Paul as well, Father, so that uh, we can learn many mighty things from him, uh, God. And bless each and every um, classmates, Father, throughout this journey, so that we have enriching knowledge in session and enriching knowledge sharing session and gaining a lot of insights so that we can, it can be helpful in our ministry life, Father. Thank you. All things shall be uh, glorified to your name. I ask this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Prabhakar. <clears throat> okay, so uh, before we go into today's session, uh, let's just do a quick review of what we did last week. Uh, last week, we completed on chapter four, which was corporate vision, mission, values, and culture. Uh, we, we looked at how, in this chapter, we looked at how important it is to have a vision. Right? And the book of Proverbs teaches us about having a vision, having a focus in life. Two, we also looked at how, when we have a vision, that needs to be backed up with a mission. Right. Uh, how am I going to achieve that vision? How am I? What What are the uh, uh, manpower I need? What is the, What is the material I need? What is the planning that is involved uh, to fulfill that vision? So that is again very important. And then we also looked at values and culture. The values and the culture of an organization is really what stands out in an organization. And right. we looked at few examples of how. Um, you know, at APC itself, we have certain values. We have certain things that, uh, as as a church, that we stand for. These are the values that we have, right? And then there's work culture, work ethics. Uh, now, different organizations will have different kinds of culture, but it's important to remember that values and culture deeply impact an organization, right? Uh, so, good values, good culture will have a good impact on the organization. When we are, you know, when there are times when we are, you know, when we don't stand for our values, when we don't stand for the things of the organization, or we, we you know, the culture, there's a shift in culture, then the organization as a whole can be affected. So, so uh, the same thing we can apply to ministry as well, right? Even in ministry, we have a vision, we have a mission, even if it's a small church or a small ministry, uh, or even if you haven't started a ministry, set these things in place. Set your vision, state your vision, state the mission to the church, to the ministry, to, the, to those involved in your ministry. Set the values, be an example, uh, you know, be a model, and then people will watch and learn. And, and it's very important to have this, you know, uh, even... Uh, I've heard of many people who are in the ministry, but they're not happy. Why? Because uh, as as a church, there are certain uh, there there was no values, there's no culture, there's no uh, you know uh, equality or uh, or uh, opportunities. So all these things affect uh, an organization. So it's very important that we have all these set in place. Whether it is small, so sometimes we think, okay, we are only ten people. It's all right. Let me grow to 50 or let me grow to 100 people and then I will share the vision. Then I will share the mission. No, it's important to, to set it first in the beginning itself, lay the foundations, be that example. And so even as the church or the ministry grows, the business grows, uh, you know, you we know, okay, these are our values. These are our culture. This is how we will work. This is how we will honor the Lord in everything that we do, right? Uh, so before we go to chapter five, any questions, any thoughts that you would like to share uh, from what we've been learning? Any questions?
Okay, so shall we move on to the next chapter? <clears throat> okay, so we'll move on to chapter five. Right? Competitive advantage and strategy. Uh, chapter five is more about uh, how, as an organization, you can differentiate yourself between the people uh, among the people around you right now for example we have many organizations who are you know just an example right who are in medicine who are helping out in the medical field you know they're doing the back end work they're doing research so how as an organization we can stand out compared to the to another organization doing the same thing right how is it what are the key differentiators? How is it that we can become a profitable organization? Uh, and, and how is it that we can be sustainable as an organization, right? Now, yes, uh, certain, you know, in ministry, we don't want to, you know, uh, look at ministry as an, uh, you know, as a competition, right? Uh, it's not like we're saying, okay, that other ministry and my ministry. So uh, how is how can my ministry better be better than their ministry? No. In terms of ministry, remember, there's different essence, right? God uh, calls us, he, we have different ministries, but there's each ministry has a different essence. So much so even in, uh, you know, in organizations in business, they have different essence. But the Bible very clearly teaches us that we are to you know, use certain principles uh, in the scriptures uh, to help us to be advantage, uh, to have a competitive advantage, to have good strategies and to do well in what has been assigned to us, right? Uh, so we'll look at a few points this morning, right, from this chapter, and we'll see how uh, we as an organization whether it's business, whether it's ministry, uh, you know, how can we stand out? How how can we be a sustainable ministry, or how can we be a sustainable organization to uh, you know to be effective in what God has called us for? So just a few points, uh, and we'll briefly touch on these points as well. First one, know what you are against. Right? Uh, let's read. Luke chapter 14, 28 to, 20, to 33. Luke 14, 28 to 33. Yes, one of us, please go ahead and read that. Uh. Luke 14, 28 to 23. If one of you is planning to build a tower, you sit down first and work out what it, what it will cost to see if you have enough money to finish the job. If you don't, you will not be able to finish the tower after laying the foundation. And all who see what happened will laugh at you. This man began to build but cannot finish the job. They will say, if a king goes out with 10,000 men to fight another king who comes against him with 20,000 men, he will sit down first and decide if he is strong enough to face the king. If he is not, he will send messengers to meet the other king to ask the term of peace while he is still a long way off. In the same way, concluded Jesus, none of you can be my disciple unless you give everything to have. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abhinas. So the Lord Jesus is saying something so practical here, and it's so wonderful. You see the wisdom of God in this entire passage if you are planning to build a tower, sit down first, figure out what it's going to cost you, right? You make a budget, you make a plan. Okay, this tower, you know, the term that tower can be meant for anything else, right? An organization or a, or a business, anything. If you're planning to start something, sit down first, figure out what it will cost you, see if you have the resources, see if you have the money, see if you are able to finish what you plan to start off. Because if you lay the foundation and later on we say, okay, I can't do this. And Jesus himself was saying, people will look and laugh. Meaning people will say, hey, he started off, but he was not able to finish it. Why did he even start it? 
right? Uh, and Jesus follows up that whole thing with an example. If a, if a king has 10,000 soldiers uh, and, and another king with 20,000 soldiers comes to attack him, he's not going to, you know, just get up and say, okay, let's all go and fight the 20,000 people. No, he has to think, okay, can 10,000 people fight against 20,000? It's like one against two. It's going to be... Uh, you know, it's going to be too much. Most probably, they're not. They're going to lose that battle. So, before the battle starts, even let me make a peace treaty with them and see if this is uh, if this problem can be resolved. So, every pursuit in life involves a cost, right? Every pursuit. You know, we've been talking about vision and all of that uh, in the previous chapter, but every pursuit, every I would say every vision that God puts in our hearts involves a cost, right? There is a price to be paid. Uh, you know, it's important to understand, to have a clear understanding of what it takes to pursue a vision. You know, God puts a vision. It's not easy for it to, you know, it's, it's not going to be very easy for everything to just unfold, you know, uh, just the way that we like it. No, there's a cost involved. There is a price, Right. Uh, do we we need to sit? We need to think. OK, is this something that we can do now? Yes, God has given a vision to me. Uh, this is what God has put in my heart. So for, let's take this example. If God has put in our heart to start a school. So we can't say, OK, I'm going to start a school. So let me stop my work. And God has put this in my heart. So I'm going to start immediately. Now, that would be the wrong thing to do. Why? Because we haven't planned, we haven't sat, we haven't thought about it, we haven't, uh, you know, processed how we're going to work out the things for the school to begin. So, if you're starting a school, there are hundreds of things that we need to look at. You got to go to the government. You got to get permission. You need to see whether you have the appropriate land, whether uh, you know the uh, you know the uh, well, what are the other schools around, what are the you know uh, uh, planning that is involved for the school. Now, if you're planning for the school, you need teachers, you need staff, you need rooms, you need to construct the place. There's a lot of things, a lot of administration involved. Now, if I just say no, I'm going to start a school, quit my job. And don't, you know, and don't really think about how I'm going to do it, then I'm going to fail, right? It is important to determine how the organization is going to grow and how, as an organization, we will be able to be, uh, you know, good in what we are doing. So if we put it in terms of ministry, uh, you know, uh, I, I've heard of plenty, plenty of people who who have started off in a hurry, right? They started off, God God spoke to them very genuinely. Uh, God had spoken to them. They've moved to different states in our nation as well. Uh, and they, they started off, but it was all in a hurry. It was not planned out well. And then they got into financial debts, financial problems. And it came to a time where, you know, they almost had to close down. Uh, but by the grace of God, they were able to, you know, God was able to help them and they continued on. So what are we trying to say? Know what you are against. In the ministry, we are against the enemy. The enemy is going to try to bring us down. He will he'll come against us in our thoughts, in our plans. He brings doubt. He brings fear. He brings, you know, the sense of failure. And then we may fall down. So even before we start anything, know what you are against. Second point is to compete clean and fair. Paul, Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. He says, an athlete who runs in a race cannot win the race unless he obeys the rules. So it's not just enough to... You know, in a in a race, for example, a two hundred meter race, it's not just enough to you know complete that two hundred meters. Okay, I, I finished. I I reached the end line. No, it is also important to obey the rules. You can't have an early start. You can't just cross lanes. Uh, you know, uh, so there are certain rules. So it's not just about finishing. It's also about rules. And so even in an organization. 
Now, there's something called as, you know, healthy competition. I'm sure all of us may have heard of this, right? Healthy competition. There's competition which can cause strife, jealousy, anger, hatred. And then there's healthy competition, right? Now, for example, uh, you, you have started a business. How can I, as an organization, have a healthy competition with the other you know the other organization it is by you know by knowing that okay these are certain principles rules that we will stand by and make sure that you know as an organization we don't collapse due to mismanagement you know misuse of funds cheating customers fraud all these things can cause an organization to stumble I remember I was reading this a couple of uh, months back. A, a very reputed ministry in the U.S. Uh, you know they they were doing really well, and uh, they had about fifteen thousand people in the church. But all of a sudden, they had to you know do an audit for their uh, organization for the church. The ministry had to go and show all their papers. Audits needed to be done, and during the audits, there was a mismanagement. There was a mismatch. They saw that there was a lot of money going to certain funds, which was not even, you know, uh, certain accounts, which was not even related to any organization. It was just made up organizations and the money was going there. And they realized that that money was being used by the uh, senior pastor himself. And so financial fraud, all these things, it, it came to a point where the, the, the ministry was put under hold. The, the entire church, the ministry stopped. Why? Because of mismanagement. Right? So in an organization, even as we serve, even as we are uh, you know, trying to be good in what we do, have healthy competition. Now, ministry... We should not have any competition, right? Uh, but we can learn from others and learn. But one thing that we can do is learn from failures, right? And and you know, trying to achieve things out of uh, wrong intent will only cause uh, failure. Will only cause a downfall uh, in the business, downfall of the organization, right? So, uh, third point: develop a winning strategy this is very interesting even as we you know uh, plan to start a business or ministry develop a winning strategy have a strategy that will enable us to uh, you know impact people's lives let's read proverbs 24 5 to 6 proverbs 24 5 and 6 Yes, any one of us? Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24, 5 to 6. It is better to be wise than strong. Intelligence outrank muscle any day. Strategic planning is the key to the warfare, to warfare. To win, you need a lot of good counsel. Thanks. Amen. Thank you, Vangi. Strategic planning is the key to warfare. To win, you need a lot of good counsel. Now, when we, as you know, this, let, let's just take a few examples now. If we start our ministry and we want to do, you know, we want to do an outreach program. Now, we need to plan strategically. You need a strategy, right? So to win, to be effective, we need a strategy. Right? We can't just say, okay, we are having a, you know, for example, a youth concert, so please come. Now, I don't know how effective that would be. Why? Because there's no strategy. There needs to be planning involved. Uh, to win, you need a strategy. A well thought out plan is required for us to reach our goals. Right? And one of the best ways of getting 
good plans, good strategies is to develop, uh, you know, is to, you know, get good counsel from our leaders, from people who are experienced, from people who have, uh, you know, uh, gone through life in many seasons, they've seen life, uh, experienced in maybe ministry or in the business, get inputs, talk to experts in the fields, survey the markets, talk to customers. You know, all these ways will help us to win, uh, to develop a winning strategy. Let me give you this example. Uh, 2019, late 2019, we had planned to do a youth concert in the city of Mangalore. Right. Now, Mangalore has a lot of students. Right? Students come from all over the country, different countries as well. Uh, they come here to study. And so we knew, okay, so students, there are a lot of them. But how do we tap into them? How do we know which, you know, which part uh, of the students are more of the English speaking students or which uh, or how, how much percentage is the uh, rural speaking uh, uh, youth. And so it was very difficult for us to, for me to understand, especially. So I thought, uh, you know, the mistake I made was in 2000, uh, I think in the 2016, we just said, okay, we'll have a youth concert. We just went out, gave invites and we, you know, we had the concert, but then we realized that we have to develop a better strategy to reach out to the youth. Right. So if it's an English concert, you want, uh, you want to target students who are more of the urban crowd, who are English speaking. Uh, but we know that there are youth from different, uh, you know, colleges in our city who are, you know, probably rural speaking. They may not even be comfortable with English. Uh, so how do we differentiate? So I, so we had to come up with a strategy. Uh, we began to see, okay, uh, what are the English colleges, uh, the good English colleges in the city? So we made a list of them. Then we looked at how uh, how many of them are, you know, Facebook users or Instagram users. And we saw, we were surprised that the Instagram usage in the city of Mangalore is almost the highest in India, in our nation. Why? Because a lot of students. So I remember we, uh, you know, we, we were discussing as a, as a team. We realized that, hey, we have never even tried uh, you know, I'm talking about 2017, 18. Uh, we never even tried Instagram, you know, uh, looking at Instagram and promoting our events on Instagram or Facebook as well. And we thought, okay, going forward, we should do this. We should, you know, promote our and target the youth. And so it was a wonderful advice given to me, you know, the IT team and all of them, they gave me the advice. They said, why don't you think about this? It's not only about, you know, going on the streets and giving invites to youth, but have a different strategy as well. Do what you're doing, but also use this strategy. And so we did it. And we had a lot of people coming for our concert and uh, quite a few of them came from ads that they saw on Facebook and Instagram. And even now, Every, every now and then we post our material on Instagram or on Facebook. And we have students who come to church, not by personal invite, but you know by Instagram or the ads that they've seen. So it's very important to develop winning strategies. Now, I didn't really think about it, right? For me, I was, for me, it's like old school. You go, you talk to students, you give them an invite, you tell them, you write their name, your, their number, give them a call, tell them, okay, hey, we'll send you an e-invite. Uh, but this really opened up to different opportunities. Once, you know, we, we're just sending that invite, it's going to about 5,000 odd youth. And, and so all of them get to see that. Uh, okay, there's a youth concert happening in this place at this time. And uh, this is how much the concert ticket costs. And this is what is happening in this concert. It's a Christian concert. Everything is put, right? And you got your details, meaning uh, if you have any questions, call back on this number, we'll be able to help you. So good advice or a good strategic planning is very, very important. Develop a winning strategy. Now we may be small in the ministry or an organization, 
or even we may be just working in an organization. We may not even be the boss. But even if you're working in an organization, develop a winning strategy. See what is what works for you. See what is, you know, which is the best way that can that you can help uh, you know, be effective in the team that you're working in. Yeah. Uh, and so Proverbs 20 verse 18 says, get good advice and you will succeed. Don't go charging into battle without a plan. So clear. Right? Get good advice and you will succeed. You know, one of the things I always try to do is I always, always ask people, uh, you know, uh, especially, you know, uh, elder pastors, pastors who've been in the ministry for many years, I always ask them questions. And I keep asking questions. I keep asking them, okay, what happened when you did this? Uh, you know, in the, a lot of pastors will say, you know, in 2000, the ministry, in the year 2000, I did ministry this way. And so I, I asked them, okay, how was it? What was it that you did? Uh, what were the things that God uh, did through your ministry, and so you get advice, you get suggestions, uh, and 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 that way, our plans will succeed. Don't go charging into battle without a plan. Set out a strategy. Have plan A, have plan B. Nothing wrong with having plan A, plan B. I, sometimes, you know, you've heard people say, I had plan A, I stuck to it, and I became successful. That's great. Uh, but have plan A, plan B, meaning have different strategies. Don't just stick to one way, right? And when we do that, we will develop a winning strategy. Right? Uh, fourth one, Goliath is not your real enemy. Fear is. First Samuel chapter 17, 10 to 11. Let's read that. First Samuel 17, 10 to 11. First Samuel 17. Eh. Sorry, sir. Sorry, Pastor, which one? First Samuel 17, 10 to 11, and verse 24 as well. Okay. First, okay. First Samuel, Samuel 17, 10 to 11, and verse 24. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all the Israel heard these words of the Philistine. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Amen. 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 Thank you, Avinas. Now, picture this. There's an entire army. Now, if we read uh, even before this whole incident, Israel was winning battles. Of, they were winning battles. They were a strong army. They've come to this place. Now an entire army of trained soldiers were left immobilized when they saw Goliath. Right? Probably previous to this, they would have seen even more scarier things or even more challenging things ahead of them. But they were able to go and fight it. But what happened this time? When they saw Goliath, fear got into them and something stopped them to go and defeat Goliath, right? Now, part of a strategy is, you know, planning a strategy is never to let fear hold you back, right? Never to let fear hold you back. It's good to, you know, uh, write down your strategies, but as you write it down, don't let the enemy bring fear into our hearts. You know, fear negates faith. Fear will stop us from walking in faith. It just blocks it out. Right? Uh, and so that's what happened to the soldiers here. The army could have gone. If you think about it practically, they've already you know, been in so many battles. They were trained people. They could have gone and fought against the Philistines. But the only thing is they saw this bad Goliath. They saw how big he was. And fear came into them. Right? The fear of failure. What if we lose? The fear of the unknown. 
what if this, you know, this big Philistine comes and, you know, we go to attack him. What if he just kills all of us? What if he comes and overpowers our place and our territory here? All these things will leave us in a place of inaction. And that is what, exactly what happened. The army, the trained army personnel was sitting around there. Probably David went there with the food to give his brothers and he was asking them, aren't you all supposed to be bat going into battle? Why are you all here just sitting around doing nothing? They were just doing nothing. There was inaction. They were supposed to go ahead, beat the Philistines, go ahead. But no, they were sitting in inaction. Why? Because of fear. David must have thought, this is not what we have, what, who we are. We are, the, we are the children of God. But fear can bring us to a place of inaction. For example, we think, okay, God, you're calling me to start my own ministry. Or you're calling me to be a worship leader or a preacher. And it's exciting. I'm sure the Israelites felt the same way. Hey, we're going to go and defeat these Philistines. But maybe sometimes the enemy puts a fear in your heart, saying, who will come to listen to you preach? You don't know how to preach. You, 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 know, you don't know how to uh, prepare a sermon also. And there are so many pastors and so many ministries. How can you? Who will, who will listen to you? Look at your own family. There's so much of trouble. There's so much of challenges. Look at your own self. You have sickness in your body. You're going through this. All these thoughts can bring fear into our lives. Remember, the enemy attacks the mind. He attacked the mind of the Israelites saying, Goliath's too big. You can't defeat him. And they went into a place of inaction. When we are making a strategy, God is calling us to do something. If the enemy is putting thoughts about who is going to do it, how is it going to happen, who is going to you know, listen to you, why would you know, people come to you, and all of these things come, your real enemy is fear. So, you, you, so what we have to do is say, God, you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. Sometimes it's only fear who keeps us from stepping ahead. Right from the idea that God gives us, you know, God gives us an idea. So there's no, no, I don't want to go ahead now. There's too much. It could be fear. Conquer fear. Step out in faith. Right now, again, uh, I'm I'm trying to be a little careful. What I'm what we are also coming to is, yes, there's a time and a season, right? But let not fear, you know. Uh, diminish that vision God has put in your heart. Let that, you know, for example, you God is telling you, you know, you feel that you have to wait three years to start your ministry. It shouldn't be that in uh, in these three years, fear or doubt should come in and the vision becomes smaller. No, it should be the other way. You know, you conquer fear, you step in faith. Okay, three years. Okay, in these three years, I'm going to prepare myself. I'm going to, I want to make a proper strategy. How will I start the ministry? Who I'm going to reach out to? Who, uh, what, am, what are the tools I'm going to use to be effective in ministry? So you, you strategize well, right? Don't let fear hold you back. Whether it is you in the workplace, whether it is in the ministry, whether even if it's a, something really small happening in our personal lives, don't let it hold you back. Fifth one, leverage your experience with lions and bears to face Goliath. This is wonderful. Leverage your experience with the lions and bears to face Goliath. Let's read this passage. It's a wonderful passage. 1 Samuel 17, 32 to 37. 1 Samuel 17, 32, verse 32 to verse 37. Yes, go ahead, please. Yes, someone can, any one of us can please read. Sir, is it uh, from 22 to 25? No, uh, 
It's First Samuel seventeen thirty-two to thirty-seven. Okay, 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 sir. Thirty-two to thirty-seven. Okay, sir. First Samuel seventeen thirty-two to thirty-seven. David said to Saul, "Your Majesty, no one should be afraid of this Philistine. I will go and fight him." No, answered Saul. How could you fight him? You are just a boy, and he has been a soldier all his life. Your Majesty, David said, "I take care of my father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear carries off a lamb, I go after it, attack it, and rescue the lamb. And if the lion or bear turns on me, I grab it by the throat and beat it to death. I have killed lions and bears." And will I will do the same to this heathen Philistine who has defied the army of the living God? The Lord has saved me from lions and bears. You will save me from this Philistine. All right, Saul answered. Go, and the Lord be with you. Amen. Thank Amen. You, Thank you, Rupa. Amen. You know, every time I've read this passage many, many times, and every time I read it, it, it just you know it just fills you with so much of strength david in his silent years looking after his father's sheep right lions have come bears have come trying to take the lamb and david has fought against the lions against the bears in his silent times nobody was there nobody was there clapping and saying oh wonderful david you did a wonderful job how did you defeat this lion how did you probably he just you know if you picture it he defeated a lion and maybe he went home he never even shared it to his brothers he just said okay it was just a lion i killed it it attacked my sheep i killed it now the moment david saw goliath he said hey he began to leverage you know he he took advantage of this whole thing and he said I have killed. So he's saying, King Saul. So King Saul, I have killed a lion and a bear with my own hands. Now a lion is obviously much stronger than Goliath. I, you know, I remember going to this uh, lion forest, uh, lion reservoir, uh, many many years back, and we were in the car and. those lions you know you can just pass by and those lions keep walking around and i and i really got to see one close by now they are ferocious they there's a reason they are the king of the jungle because they are very intimidating you know the i remember the the driver of our vehicle kept saying lock your car lock your car he kept saying that because they are able to even you know open the doors and uh, he was also saying that we shouldn't be too long near the the lions because if they get too intimidated they are also able to break the windshield of the car so they're very 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 strong animals very intimidating now david is leveraging his this situation and he's saying okay king saul i have killed the lion and the bear nobody has seen that but i have i've broken its jaw off i've i've killed it with my own my own hands i will do the same thing to this philistine Right. the odds were heavily against david he's a, david goliath is a he's in the army david you are just a shepherd boy a shepherd against a soldier doesn't match no one in their right mind would go against goliath but here's what david did david tapped into what happened you know, in his life the history he had with god probably he was sitting alone looking after a sheep a lion came probably that came to his mind hey i attacked this lion i killed a lion how much more will i not kill this philistine and he that was something that gave him that courage and that boldness is to say that if god you help me kill the lion i can kill goliath as well every small success that god gives us is an advantage for bigger success ahead right 
Now, a small success, not everyone will be there to, uh, you know, clap and to encourage and to appreciate us. It's all right. Right. Uh, this, this usually, you know, it happens in ministry, you know, we may be doing something very small. Uh, but and, and you've been doing it well and it was successful. Not every time will they say, oh, excellent job. You have you've been successful. Not every time. But there'll come a time when you can leverage those situations when it's really needed in the future. Right? David had a competitive advantage over the others. Why? Probably the others in the uh, army did not kill a lion with their own hands. David had. So he had a advantage over all of them. Of course, he knew who his God was, but there was this advantage that in his mind, hey, God help me kill the lion. The lion is stronger than Goliath, so I can kill Goliath. End of story. Let me go. David didn't see, oh, no, I'm not trained. I'm not. No, no, no. So we can have a competitive advantage when we build on small successes. Right? Small success. Uh uh, don't don't worry if nobody uh, you know congratulates you or honors you for it just keep moving ahead in ministry or in your business just keep moving ahead those small successes will come in handy uh, as you as you progress in your uh, you know in your workplace in your business sometimes just one pebble is all it takes sixth point David, you know, he, he didn't have, you know, all the weapons and the artillery that the army usually have. You know, King Saul himself said, you wear this, you wear this, you take the sword, you take the shield and all of those things. He didn't have all of that. All he had was just one pebble, probably a few pebbles that he took. That one pebble destroyed this huge man, Goliath. Let's read First Samuel chapter 17, verse 40, and then verse 49 and 50. First Samuel 17 and verse 40, then 49 and 50. Yes. Uh, one of us, please go ahead and read that. First Samuel 17, 40 and 49, 50. He took his shepherd stick and then picked up five small stones from the steam and put them in his bag. With his sling ready, he went out to meet Goliath. He reached into he, he reached into his bag and took out a stone, which he slung at Goliath. It, it hit him on a forehead and broke his skull, and Goliath fell face downward on the ground. And so Without a sword, David defeated and killed Goliath with a sling and a stone. Amen. Man, thank you, Abina. So this is wonderful, right? Maybe Goliath thought, okay, this boy is going to come out and uh, with all his, the sword. And uh, maybe he thought, okay, this, he want, he expected somebody to come who had, you know, the entire, uh, you know, armor on him. Probably Goliath laughed at David looking at him just coming with a you know a small sling and five stones but that was david's strength david knew how to use that that sling and the stone that was his strength right uh, and so david used something that he was skilled at and with precision he was able to you know hit goliath on the head and he david uh, killed goliath that was something which was completely unexpected, unconventional. Nobody thought of it. Probably the David's brothers, I can picture them saying, oh, no, we're going to lose our brother. He's gone with a sling and a five pebbles to beat this king. To, sorry, to beat Goliath. We've been waiting here for five days trying to figure out who will go. A sling and a stone, very unconventional. What looked like a disadvantage was really David's competitive advantage. He used his strength to fight against the enemy. He didn't use the other person's strength. 
the others said you wear this armor you take the sword i if he had gone that way probably he would have lost his agility he would have lost his you know his uh, flexibility or his strength to you know use the sling but all david did was he used what he was effective in what he was you, you know uh, 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 you know learned in and he used that to become to bring victory so what is it that we learn from this very important leveraging your core competencies doing something what you're really skilled at when god has given us certain skills leverage it use it for god's kingdom right uh, i i remember i liked i liked watching you know english you know all these english episodes growing up as as school kids we watched a lot of these you know cartoons and uh, just more of you know the american english or the british english and so we grew up uh, as a family listening to that right we would always watch english serials and how uh, when growing up english cartoons so one thing i knew is english is not a problem right so everywhere i would go i would uh, i knew that okay for speaking it's no problem right of course you know uh, other part of uh, you know i i didn't like to read right but i knew i could speak well i knew that i can get through things just by speaking right? so there are many times i've used the speaking ability to overcome situations it's a advantage and the same way god gives all of us god has given each one of us a skill so we are to use that skill for uh you know bringing success uh, uh you know use that area of skill for innovation for strategies for uh you know something that can help uh your organization or even uh, your ministry right sometimes all it takes is just a pebble right you don't have to do too many things sometimes uh just just be use what the strengths that god has given us and that can be more than enough get the lord's counsel get uh, even as you strategize very important i love what david did david was a perfect example of depending on the lord he is now the king of israel and he does something so wonderful the bible teaches us that he for every battle he would go up to god and say god should i go against these people will you come with me now david didn't have to do that because he had a mighty army by then he was a king of israel but he humbled himself and he went up to god and he said god should i go will you be with me will you teach me you know god revealed the same thing through jacob and 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 god is a god who reveals his counsel right so get the lord's counsel even as you strategize get counsel from the lord ask god to speak to us through a vision or dream through the word of god a prophetic word ask for counsel uh if you see joseph wonderfully god you know gave him the counsel uh when you see uh daniel god gave him counsel right they received counsel from god nehemiah we looked at how nehemiah was able to you know build the walls and build the gate how is that counsel from god as well right so god can speak and reveal to us what he wants to do uh for us right uh, be open to unusual strategies there'll be times that god will give us unusual strategies uh just like the example of uh, the walls of jericho it is an unusual strategy i mean the conventional strategy would be okay let's go and physically destroy the wall the wall of jericho but god said no joshua here's what you do very unconventional but you listen to me you go around this wall and you you do that seven times don't don't scream don't don't sing don't don't without a word just go around the wall and then the seventh time on the seventh day go seven times around the wall and after you finish it blow your trumpets and praise the lord with all your heart 
And when you do that, the walls will come crumbling down. Right? It, 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 when we read that story, the people of Jericho were wondering, what are these Israelites doing? Why are they going around the wall? It's not making sense. They probably laughed and said, okay, they are, you know, they're probably scanning the place around to see whether they can defeat the wall. And once they see it, they're getting discouraged and going back. No, no, no. God gave them a different strategy. Be open to unusual strategy. Uh, I'll, okay, we've passed our time. All right. Okay, we'll stop here. Next uh, Tomorrow we'll continue with the other two points, and then we'll pick up from uh, next chapter as well. All right. Uh, so any questions, any thoughts? So shall we close in prayer? Okay. All right, let's let's close in prayer. Uh, you guys have to go back to your next session. Uh, Rupa, is it okay if you can close in prayer for us? Prabhakar, uh, so how do you think we can find out what we are good at? What I would do is... Uh, okay, uh, Prabhakar, is, is it okay if we can answer your question uh, yes, tomorrow? Yes, yes, sure. Yes. Probably you can just keep that question uh, in your mind. You probably make a note of it, and uh, we'll answer this question tomorrow. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Prabhakar. Yes, go ahead, Rupa. Please close okay, the prayer. Sir. Thank you, sir. Father, thank you for this morning, and thank you for the lessons you have taught, it, taught us through the word. Even though we have heard them so many times, thank you for the new insights you have given us to build up and continue in the vision you have given us in your strength and the strategies you provide us in the name of jesus father we thank you bless each one of us and our fathers pastor this morning lord fill us anew afresh that we may father reach out to all that you have kept in store for us lord to do all that Father, according to your will and purpose, to your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Rupa. Thank you, everyone. Have a great you, day sir. ahead. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.